thank you all for being here. This is a wonderful turnout. I'm so thrilled. So I have known Dr. Gary Kaplan since 1983, when we were about two years old, right? <laughs> we were actually chief residents at Georgetown um, Family Medicine Residency um, together. And I joined him in practice in 1999 and joined this wonderful Kaplan team that's all here. They're just fabulous, yay. <laughs> um, so I'm gonna tell you a little bit about him. So we have a lot, I have to have it all written down here. Uh, Dr. Gary Kaplan, he is the founder and medical director of the Kaplan Center for Integrative Medicine in McLean and author of Total Recovery, a revolutionary new approach to breaking the cycle of pain and depression. He's a pioneer and a leader in the field of integrative medicine and lectures all over the world. Dr. Kaplan is board certified in family medicine, pain medicine, medical acupuncture, and osteopathic medicine. He's a clinical associate professor in the Department of Community and Family Medicine at Georgetown. And he's, in 2013, Dr. Kaplan was appointed by the U.S. Secretary of Health and Human Services to the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee, which he did for four years. Dr. Kaplan recently put together a three-day symposium with top researchers from around the world to discuss autoimmune encephalopathy in relation to infections like Lyme. And he's also working on a book and a white paper in relation to this symposium. Recently, Dr. Gary Kaplan and I attended a three-day um, lecture by Dr. Richard Horwitz up in upstate New York, a leading Lyme expert. And we've utilized some of the tools, many of the tools that he has um, taught us. Tonight, Dr. Gary Kaplan will talk about his own research in Lyme. So join me in a warm welcome for my dear friend and colleague, Dr. Gary Kaplan. I'm delighted by the turnout and depressed. <laughs> this is a horrible disease. It impacts so many people. It's devastated so many people's lives. And we need better answers. I think we have a few more pieces of the puzzle. I hope that tonight I'm going to be able to give you some potentially other ways to think about this disease and other things that might be able to get you back to your own path of total recovery. I have to acknowledge first that I'm wearing my Lyme socks tonight. <laughs> Thank you, Jen. <laughs> Seemed appropriate for the occasion. So the center has been around for a few years. Uh, as Dr. Lisa said, we, we started when we were 12. Um, and so we've been at this for quite some time. And we're a center that has a number of different positions specializing in pain medicine, in functional medicine, uh, in family medicine, uh, physical medicine and rehab. Uh, we also have physical therapists on board, uh, acupuncturists, uh, a psychotherapist, nutritionist, a meditation instructor. We do a series of IV therapies. For the work we do, it truly takes a village. You can't do this as a solo practitioner. It's too much. You guys need too much. The complexity of this disease has so many layers to it that you have to be prepared to operate on a lot of different levels and no one person can embody all of the expertise necessary. So we've built a team. Now, I'm a chronic pain specialist. So I've got people coming to me from around the country dealing with complex chronic pain problems, chronic fatigue syndrome, fibromyalgia, chronic headaches, and then things started to expand a bit. It turned out that a number of the people we were looking at had Lyme, had not been diagnosed with Lyme. A patient of mine from Florida, uh, chronic fatigue, <coughs> chronic pain, multiple workups, um, was told in no uncertain terms that Lyme didn't exist in Florida. <laughs> she had. CDC positive Lyme. Uh, the next year, by the way, the ILADS program was held uh, in Florida, and the state epidemiologist uh, spoke to us and said, you know, in our surveys, 
there are as many ticks infected with Lyme around here as you guys have up north. So we're left with a couple of conclusions. Either our ticks don't bite people, <laughs> our people are immune to Lyme, or our doctors are missing the diagnosis. And obviously it's the latter, right? So what we're going to do today is we're going to go through some definitions of diagnosis and testing. We're going to talk about treatments, specifically more toward antibiotics. We're going to talk about detoxification and management of the Herxheimer reactions. We're going to talk about what you have to do to protect your gut in order to get through this whole process because what we do can be pretty damn hard on the gut and the gut is crucial uh, in your recovery. Uh, we're going to talk about the immune response and that's an area that I've done a lot of work in and one that I'm for some godforsaken reason writing a second book on. Um, but uh, it's extremely important. Part of what's happened, part of where our work started back in 2000, early 2000s, with the opioid epidemic coming on, uh, it wasn't an epidemic at that point. At that point, my, my academy had brilliantly endorsed the idea that it was okay to give opioids um, for people who had chronic pain. And I started doing that and started finding that my patients were seat soaring back and forth between chronic pain and depression. Yeah. And I'm going, this doesn't make any sense. And I was blessed to be in contact with a number of colleagues, Dr. Jose Apud being one of them, who was at that point at NIMH, a uh, number of colleagues from Georgetown. And we sat down and we said, what's going on? And the answer to the question was, what we were looking at is a neuroinflammatory disease, an inflammation of the brain. And we weren't thinking about what chronic pain was properly. We weren't thinking about what depression was properly. And it was out of that that my first book came out. We'll go over this stuff as we're going through it. And then we're going to talk about putting missing pieces. This is the war zone. Okay, ILADS, the International Lyme and Associated Disease Society. I am a proud member of ILADS for many years. Um, I think ILADS is doing pioneering, spectacular work in the field. I am not a member of the Infectious Disease Society of America, who have a very different opinion about what Lyme disease is. Not quite sure that chronic Lyme disease exists. Um, and a number of my patients have not anything particularly nice to say about this end of the universe. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, there is a difference of opinion. And we need to be respectful of that difference of opinion. And they have rightfully held our feet to the fire to say, we need better research. You prove this to us. You say that, you prove it. And we've been doing that. And we've got a lot, in the last two years alone, a lot of really exciting stuff has come up. So let's start putting this puzzle together. And let's start with a definition, testing, and diagnosis. So what's Lyme disease? Well, it's the most common tick-borne, vector-borne infection in North America. It's caused by Borrelia burgdorferi. Senso stricto means that's the family. Okay, so there's a lot of Borrelia species. Uh, and it's found in this tick, Sixoides scapularis, on the East Coast. On the West Coast, it's Ixoides pacificus. So two ticks transmitting the same disease, different ends of the country. Recently, uh, we've got a new Borrelia species that's been showing up. And guess what? We don't especially test for it. So it can show up, and we'll miss it. Uh, and so it's responsible for percentage of the cases that we're seeing. Perhaps some of these will, are referred to as seronegative Lyme disease. Uh, the other part of the problem also is a number of different Borrelia species in Europe, OK? Anybody here ever go to Europe? Go camping, go hiking, go whatever? So we've got people who have been infected while overseas and brought the, the tick back with them. But again, it's different species. So it really presents a challenge in diagnosis if all we're looking for is this guy in our testing. And our testing is that specific. It looks for this guy, and if these are present, raging in our system, we won't find it. And then there's a whole series of co-infections that come with the ticks. The ticks can carry, and just exodes can carry anaplasma, vivacium, uh, the other Borrelia species we talked about, uh, and Bartonella. Okay, Bartonella is a bit controversial. Um, Lone star ticks. So there are other ticks that carry other diseases. So, but this is the guy we're mostly concerned with on the East Coast. Bartonella, 
there was debate for the longest time as to whether or not Bartonella was passed by ticks. The answer is it is. It's also passed by fleas. It's also passed by, by cat scratch. There's a number of other ways that it can be done. This is the classic presentation, but this is a, Borrelia, is a Bartonella rash, the stria, these red, bright stria that you see. And I put this picture down here because there's stria here, which are stretch marks. This is not stretch marks. Okay? And you want to know how psychotic things can get? This kid we've proven has Bartonella. All right? <coughs> We've had a pitch battle going with ID at one of the local hospitals who said, this is not Bartonella. We said, okay, what is it? I said, I don't know. We got two dermatologists who said, oh yeah, that's, that's pretty much a classic Bartonella rash. And I've got one ID who said, no, this is cutting behavior. <laughs> These marks are in the center of his back. Okay? So cutting behavior is tricky to do when A, you haven't cut the skin. <laughs> and B, straight lines. Right? I mean, it's just insane. But it's about bending light to make yourself right. Okay, and this is what we're up against. Not wanting to see what, in fact, is sitting in front of us. So, again, looking at exoides, this little guy is about the size of a poppy seed. The adult female is about a sesame seed. These are not big critters, all right? The, for the most part, the most active time for the nymphs, the nymphs are what spread most of the disease, okay? Spring, summer, and fall. In the winter, if you don't get a really good freeze, the adult females continue to feed, and they can also pass the disease during the winter. So basically, it's a four-season disease. There's about 300,000 new cases of Lyme disease diagnosed in this country every year. Lyme disease and its sequelae are responsible for significant numbers of school and work absences. At this point, early estimates are about a billion dollars a year for the healthcare system. It's a lot of money. Due to insensitivity of diagnostic testing, incident estimates based solely on these tests are likely to significantly <coughs> undercount the numbers of infected people. 300,000 is an underestimation. And this is what's changed in the distribution of the disease in this country. Now, I'm not sure if this changed so much in the distribution or changed in our recognition of it. But look what's happened between 2001 and 2017. Huge increase in the, in the uh, number of incidents reported. Oklahoma seems to have been left out. But virtually every other state in the nation has reported the occurrence of Lyme. So the definition of this post-treatment Lyme syndrome, all right, I already got took to task by a number of people at the conference we held at Georgetown. They didn't like this. They want chronic uh, Lyme disease. They want a Lyme disease complex. We're not up yet. Okay? There's a lot involved here, as you'll see as we go through this. Uh, Post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome is characterized by incapacitated fatigue, pain, neurocognitive dysfunction, the brain doesn't work. That persists for more than six months after an acute Lyme disease diagnosis. By the way, the International Society for Infectious Disease, that's their definition. So they've now finally come to acknowledge that this condition exists. Symptoms can be intermittent or constant and are often subjective and varied in nature brain fog, difficulty, focus, and concentration, joint pains that move around the body. Nothing necessarily to see is a lot to hear if you'll sit and listen. Uh, so a single case definition uh, for post-treatment Lyme disease syndrome and its diagnosis is often made based on exclusion of other conditions such as other tick-borne co-infections. The most common symptoms that we see, fatigue, hands down number one. Migratory muscle and joint pain. There is nothing else that produces migratory muscle and joint pain. Rheumatoid arthritis creates pain in joints, specific joints, and stays there. Arthritis is in specific joints. Other diseases and conditions may generalize pain, but it doesn't move around the body the way this does. So this is a rather unique feature of Lyme disease. 
it's migratory. It can affect the cardiac system, it can affect the neurologic system, and in affecting the neurologic system, man, can we get confused. There have been case reports of diagnosis of Alzheimer's, Chris Christopherson being the most famous, turned out to be Lyme disease. There are case reports of Parkinson's disease that in fact were Lyme disease. Multiple sclerosis that in fact were Lyme disease. Does this mean every case of Parkinson's and multiple sclerosis is Lyme disease? Absolutely, positively not. But it does mean we ought to go look. Because if it's there, we can treat it. So we don't want to be missing these things. Neuropsychiatric, all right? Pan's pandas population, I don't know if you're familiar with that, but it's pediatric autoimmune nervous system disorders. These kids have some really bizarre behaviors and get very sick. I had one kid who was 17 year old male, developed a severe eating disorder, severe obsessive compulsive disorder, very quickly over a period of days. They're trying to hospitalize him psychiatrically. He didn't have strep. Pandas requires that you have strep, pandas doesn't. I saw him and I'm listening to the seizure attacks and everything else. I said, this sounds like an infection. Something happened, an event. And the answer was Lyme disease. So got the testing back. The pediatrician stopped talking to me <laughs> because it couldn't be Lyme disease. It wasn't pandas because I hadn't read the 2013 consensus conference. And this is what we go back and forth. It's like a lot of times I'm arguing with people, read your own literature. I'm not making this up. Read your own literature. We can discuss and debate whether or not you like the results of a given study, but read it. Then let's talk about it as opposed to belief systems. Cases of schizophrenia have been in fact found to be Lyme disease. Lyme is a neuroinflammatory disease, and we'll talk about what that means in a little while. And when that happens, you can see bipolar expressions, you can see schizophrenic expressions, you'll see depression, you'll see anxiety disorders. You gotta think about it. This autonomia is this business of, so there's three components to the nervous system. Okay? There's the brain and the spinal cord. There's the peripheral nervous system, that's everything outside the spinal column. And then there's the autonomic nervous system, that's the sympathetic and parasympathetic. So sympathetic is fight or flight, parasympathetic is rest and digest. When those systems don't work well, what happens? Your blood pressure doesn't get maintained. So you stand up, you fall down. Because your blood pressure doesn't accommodate fast enough in order to tolerate that. Your heart rate may go through the ceiling trying to maintain it, but it may not be good enough. All kinds of sweating behavior that goes on. Problems with the gastrointestinal tract. It's a systemic disease. Basically, you need the autonomic nervous system for a lot of things to happen. And that can get in a problem as part of what we see in Lyme disease. <whistles> Peripheral neuropathies, uh, the chronic inflammatory, um, there are degenerative neuropathies that stop you from being able to stand and walk. Okay, that can be secondary to Lyme. Now, at this point in time, the prevalence of the disease in 2016 was estimated between 70,000 and 1.5 million. A wild ass guess. <laughs> All right, the prevalence may be as high as 2 million now in the coming year. Now let's, let's put this in perspective. All right, I served at Health and Human Services um, for four years uh, on the um, Myalgic Encephalomyelitis Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee. All right, we estimate that this disease affects somewhere between 1 to 2 million people. Okay? We had to fight tooth and nail to get funding of five million dollars so we could do studies for them. Multiple sclerosis, 800,000 people. Less than half. And the budget for, for studying and treating multiple sclerosis, I don't remember the exact number, but it's easily tenfold. No, it's more than that. It's almost uh, twentyfold of what we were spending for MECSF. <laughs> so we have a massive problem, and it's underfunded in terms of diagnosis and treatment. So the testing we're able to do is both the indirect and the direct test. The indirect test is we're looking at your body's response to the disease, the antibodies that it makes. 
So if your body made an antibody, we measure that, and that tells us you have the disease. If your body didn't happen to make that antibody because you're immunosuppressed, because there's any of a number of problems going on, you don't make the antibody, testing's negative. Direct testing is we actually look directly at the bug. We see the bug, we see the DNA pattern of the bug, the RNA pattern of the bug. But the problem is the testing isn't really great. Nanotrap is a test that was developed actually here at George Mason University. Uh, it's a urine test. If that test is positive, you have Lyme disease. If that test is negative, I don't know what you got. Because we don't know what the false negative rate is for that test. It's a good test if it's positive. For the most part, the immunoblock is now what we think uh, is the better test to utilize. The immunoblock test for Lyme disease has a sensitivity and specificity greater than 93%. Whereas the ELISA and the Western bought that two-tier testing, which has been forever, is only at about 58%. 58% this isn't better than 40% of the cases with the CDC recommended standard two-tier testing. So the challenges, the low sensitivity and specificity of the available testing, the issue of false negative tests, other forms of Lyme, of Borrelia that we weren't able to pick up, improper immuno response on the part of the individual for whatever reason. A large number of people are subsequently diagnosed with Lyme disease and don't remember the bite. 25% of patients with Lyme disease never develop erythema migrans. That's a classic erythema migrans. Showed up about a month ago for one of my relatives. This is an erythema migrans non-classic presentation. Erythema migrans is an immune response in the skin to this disease. All right, so it's not at necessarily at the site of the bite. It will occur anywhere else in the body. And it will show up mm, two, three weeks after the bite. The gradual progression of symptoms. You don't necessarily get sick in a day. You may, in fact, get sick think it's an acute viral infection of some kind, and then you never quite recover, and you've got this low-grade ick going on. And then other things start happening, and then your health starts to decline. And then the right tests are not necessarily done at the right time. If you're doing the indirect testing, and you got bit by a test, you know, the immunoblots or whatever, you got bit by a, a tick today, and you're running your doctor, and you say, I got bit, and they do the testing, the testing will be normal. Unless, of course, you've had Lyme disease sometime in the past. Because it takes at least two to three weeks for the immune response to occur for us to have the antibodies that we can then measure. So you test within a week or two of getting bit, we'll miss it. The new diagnostic tools, are, this just came out, we're, we're waiting to sort out exactly what it is, but this was just recommended in the last week or two. The new diagnostic testing calls for two-tier uh, enzyme uh, immunoassays run uh, concurrently or sequentially. Uh, it's a modified, it, it's to replace the two-tier testing, so it doesn't rely on Western blood antibodies. Um, we're waiting for details. This is just got released by the FDA. We'll see. So our approach. Now, the really first thing you need to keep in mind is that this is basically a clinical diagnosis. It's a multi-system disease, and you have to take a very careful history and do a very thorough physical in the process of working individuals suffering with this condition. All right? My intake is two hours. You gotta sit, you gotta listen, you gotta get the whole history, you gotta figure out the sequence of how we got here, and then you've gotta go over ahead to tell what's going on. And then you figure out which testing to work. The testing we look at is here. The Horowitz Health Questionnaire is a rather interesting instrument. It's a fairly new instrument. Uh, basically, Rich uh, went to the trouble of creating a lengthy questionnaire that allows you to score your symptoms to determine whether or not you're at risk for having Lyme disease. So this is, again, moving to the clinical point of it. But there's, a, there's a, at least a, this is validated in the literature. Very important that we validate what we do so that other people can replicate what we do. And for those of you who are interested, outside, we've got, you may already have, 
We have copies of the Horowitz questionnaire for a few guys to take. And I would invite you to take those and share those and copy them. Basically, above 44 on that test is high probability of lying. Most of the people we see bang around 90 to 120. So, kind of an overview of testing diagnosis. So what do we do for treatment? So, doxy is a lovely idea, but it's not the be all and end all. It certainly should be part of what we're talking about, but it shouldn't be everything. This is a tricky bug. It's been around a very, very long time, which means that it's figured out how to survive in very harsh environments. So it goes through lots of different changes. Because of this, it exists in different compartments in the body. So think about if you have a house, okay? And something has invaded your living room. And you have guys who specialize in going in and cleaning up your living room. They don't look at the kitchen, they don't look at the bathroom, they don't look at the basement, they only look at the living room. So if the problem is in multiple rooms, you need to have specialists who will actually move into all of the different rooms that the problem may be in. That's what happens with Lyme in the body. It's in different compartments in the body, and different antibiotics are better at penetrating different compartments. All right, so if you have a prostatitis, an infection of the prostate gland, probably not something women need to be especially con concerned about. <laughs> but in men, it's a really hard place to get antibiotics, and only a few specific antibiotics can be used in order to treat an infection there. So we have to know where in the body the infection is. We have to know which parts of the body, the compartments of the body. And that helps guide us in terms of the antibiotics that we can use that'll be helpful. We also have to know that the antibiotic will actually kill the bug we're going after, because that's not true for all, okay? Now, Lyme is trickier. It also moves into a cystic form, an L form, all right? In this form, these antibiotics don't work. We need to go to these. So we need to know to rotate our antibiotics because we're treating different forms of the disease. And yet, for all our clever rotation of antibiotics and all our clever mixing and matching of antibiotics, for some godforsaken reason, a huge number of people went on to continue to have Lyme disease. This is the reason. Morelia, Erdothi, Bartonella, and Babesia all do very unique things. They are what's called persister organisms. They move into a biofilm that lets them hide from the antibiotics. And then we need specialized antibiotics or specialized medications to be able to treat those forms. This is the newest, latest, greatest stuff on the block. So Dapsone is stuff Rich Horowitz has written about. Uh, it's published a couple of papers on it. It's the one we have the most data on. Now, the way we find this, by the way, is first off, somebody had to figure out how to grow a persister form in a test tube. And then we throw lots of chemicals at it to see what kills it and what doesn't. And then we have a couple of winners. These two drugs were the winners. There's a couple of others, but they haven't panned out clinically as well as we told. So, Dapsone and Disulfur. These persister bugs are sitting inside a biofilm. The bugs get stressed, it hides, and then it goes into a kind of hibernation. It divides very, very, very slowly. And so we need special drugs to go after this in order to kill it in that form. All right, there's precedent for this. Leprosy, tuberculosis. All right, this is not unique in terms of this bug it's suddenly doing something other bugs don't do, which is a good thing. Because otherwise we start going, wait a minute, how, where'd this alien come from? No, it's just a variation on a theme of what other bugs are doing. So knowing this, we think now, we, many of us in, in the Lyme community think, we may actually have the answer for getting rid of this post-treatment Lyme syndrome. Because now we've got Dapsone and Disulfur. <coughs> Dapsone. 
that's on, and neither of these drugs are completely benign. So we want to be really clear why we're using them and how we're using them. Dapsone creates problems with anemias, and so we need to make sure we're using high-dose folic acid along with it. Dapsone can create problems with a thing called methemoglobin. Methemoglobin means that the red blood cells in your blood no longer carry oxygen. That's not a good thing, because actually that's mostly what they're supposed to do. So we have ways of treating that also with other medications such as methylene blue. The point of the matter is you can't be a novice playing with this. You actually have to know what you're doing, when to do the testing, what supplements and what other medications you need to use and how to balance this stuff. But this shows huge promise. This guy just showed up about two months ago. Ken Leitinger wrote a paper. Again, we've made copies of some of these papers back there for you if you're interested. Uh, these were case reports. So we've got real little reports on this, all right? Horowitz has published well north of 600 case studies on this. Four studies. Okay? Four studies, not four case studies. So not lots and lots of data. Nevertheless, again, disulfiram came out of this grow it, in a, grow it in a test tube, throw drugs at it, see what happens. Disulfiram used to be used for vulcanizing rubber. And what they found is that the guys who were working in the rubber plants, when they went to go drink afterwards, were getting really sick. And somebody said, hmm, I wonder if this would help alcoholics. This is an abuse. And yes, if you drink alcohol with this drug, you will be a very unhappy individual. We've got 60 years of experience with this drug in an alcoholic population. There are some potentially nasty side effects with this drug. You can go blind. It can do brain damage. It can do peripheral nerve damage. It can kill your liver. Again, not a drug you want to reach for casually. What percentage of people does it do this in? We don't know. There are case reports in the literature. We know that the risk sits out there. But again, remember for 60 years, we've been using this drug in what we casually refer to as an unreliable population. They're drinking, they're using drugs. God knows what they're combining with this drug. So is this drug itself a problem or are we running into problems because of all the things that they're taking that they should not have been taking with this drug? So we're using this medication, we're using it thoughtfully and carefully. There's a large number of us in the Lyme community who've started to use this medication. So far it's looking very promising. But we got a ways to go. NIH got so excited about this, they handed out two grants kind of instantaneously. And so those studies are underway, but it's going to be a year, year and a half before we have that data. And I don't think most of you want to wait that long. Now, you can't just go ahead and start throwing antibiotics at people because most of you guys have been sick for a very, very long time. So we've got to get your own natural healing processes working. <coughs> so we've got to detox. Glutathione. Glutathione is the most abundant antioxidant in the central nervous system. All right, basically cells do lots of work. They make lots of waste products. And glutathione is necessary to help clean up those waste products. You don't have glutathione, your brain gets toxic. Difficulty focus, concentrations, sleep disturbances. Any symptoms sound familiar? So we've got to get your detox pathways working. If you have a defect in MTHFR, your methylation pathways, this is a genetic issue. We know that we have to do something in order to, this prevents you from using folic acid to make it into methylfolate, which is the form the brain needs. So that if you have an MTHFR problem, you're not effectively converting um, folate into methylfolate, your brain's not going to do well with that. We found that that's one of the reasons a whole bunch of our antidepressants don't work. Because in people who have this problem, we can fix it. We give them methylated folate. It's a supplement. It's easy. But it's not easy if you don't know that it's there. There's using high dose vitamin C that we use in our center, uh, but also things like Epsom salt bath, powder magnesium, Epsom salt water. It helps open the pores, helps relax the muscles. Infrared sauna, sweating, 
the skin is an organ of elimination. So we want to make sure that your pores are open and you're sweating. Dry brushing, lymphatic drainage, gentle exercise. We want to make sure your bowels are working and that your magnesium levels are adequate. Okay? A lot of people are magnesium deficient, especially when you've been sick, as long as many of you have been sick. We need to put magnesium back into you. Activated charcoal can help absorb toxins within the gastrointestinal tract. Uh, activated ultra binder is just the form of that. And then we want to quiet your, get your diet. We want you on a low inflammatory diet. All right, there's a number of ways to do that, but basically rice, fish, chicken, fresh fruits, vegetables. We want to eliminate the major things that create allergens, gluten, soy, corn, okay? Milk, milk products. We just take them away because we want to give your gut a rest. Then we have this other issue when we're treating with Herx reactions. Now what Herx reactions are is these bugs die off, they release a whole series of endotoxins that set off a whole inflammatory reaction and the next thing you know is you're sicker than you were before we started treating you. Now you're not pleased with us at all. <laughs> and then we go, and I'm sitting there as patients are coming back to me going, I feel horrible. And I'm going, great. <laughs> Proof of concept. I've given you an antibiotic. You got worse because of the die off from the bug. I'm killing bugs. I'm happy. You may not be as happy with me, but this is an extremely important part of treatment. Now, you also need to make sure that it's not an allergic reaction to the medication or some side effect from the medication. So again, you need to be intelligent about what's going on and you need to have very good communication with your provider. All right, this is not a solo act. You need to be able to be able to call and ask questions. Treating Herx, there's a lot of things we can do to treat Herx. Again, the IV vitamin, glutathione, resveratrol, curcumin, which is anti-inflammatory, Alka-Seltzer Gold. Not Alka-Seltzer, Alka-Seltzer Gold. I don't know what the magic ingredient is in Alka-Seltzer Gold. <laughs> <laughs> we know what the ingredients are in Alka-Seltzer, but it's a proprietary piece of information for the gold part. But that actually makes a difference. It's hard to find that um, in most drugstores online, though it's easy to buy. Lemon juice, alpha alcoholic acid, again, the saunas, acupuncture can be very effective. Uh, and berber and panella in terms of herbs. The berber and panella, just a heads up, are tinctures. Tinctures are in alcohol. If you're taking disulfur, <coughs> that's probably not one of the things you want to use. All right. The next thing we want to look at is protecting the gut itself. So you're getting the picture, this is a complex operation. You need to be thinking about a lot of things at once. It's not just here, take this antibiotic, go away, and you're done. So we've got to protect the balance of the gut microbiome. The gut microbiome is about a two and a half pounds of bacterial DNA and parasitic DNA and mold DNA. And basically, there's more DNA in your gut than there is in your body by a factor of 10. And that is in communication with all the rest of us. An unhealthy gut microbiome is an unhealthy body. A leaky gut where the, the membrane between uh, with the mucosal barrier in the gut and the blood that determines what gets into your blood. Remember the inside of the gut is outside of you. So it's not until it passes into the blood that it enters you. So if that gets inflamed and that gets damaged, all kinds of things start moving into the bloodstream that don't belong there. There's all kinds of communication. The gut is literally our second brain. And there's tons of communication that moves back and forth between the gut and the brain. So we have to do everything we can to protect it. While, by the way, we are throwing nuclear weapons at it with the antibiotics we're using. Let's be honest. <laughs> so we've got to protect against fungal overgrowth. And there's a number of ways we can do that. We've got to protect the permeability of the gut. Uh, and we've got to be guarding against all kinds of nutritional deficiencies. You need to be thinking in a very comprehensive manner as you're doing this stuff. You need to be aware that on the one hand where you're doing lots of good and killing bugs, on the other hand, you may be doing damage to the body. And you need to be balancing this. 
Now the immune response, my favorite area. The immune system is essentially divided into two great big areas, the innate immune system and the acquired adaptive immune system. The innate immune system are our first responders, okay? They rush to the scene as soon as there's been any tissue damage. And they start killing bugs if there's any bugs in the area, or if there's just tissue damage from trauma, they start cleaning up the mess. So think of them, you're gonna renovate a room in your house. The first thing you gotta do is you gotta get a demolition crew in to take down the walls and take up the carpeting and get ready for the repair guys to come in. And that's what the innate immune system does. However, if the innate immune system has been damaged for too long, it's been put on the job for too long, it develops a type of PTSD. And it keeps firing and firing and firing. And as opposed to renovating that living room, it's now reno renovating your kitchen, it's renovating your bathroom, it's renovating the downstairs, the upstairs. It's tearing apart your whole house. So we have to be attentive to the immune system as part of our treatment program. And just a quick overview, because I spend hours lecturing on this stuff. There's basically two big pieces of the innate immune system in the brain. Microglia, these are kind of the electricians of the cell. And when we went looking for the microglia and trying to understand what they were, all right, what we found was A, they were the innate immune system. Because we said, okay, if there's neuroinflammation in the brain, what mediates the inflammation? The answer is microglia. Okay, so something's happened, they rush to the scene, and then they produce lots of different chemicals. So what it is, what is it that sets these guys off? And the answer is toxins, mold toxins, toxins from the environment from different chemicals, pesticides, autoimmune diseases, celiac disease to set these things off, other autoimmune processes. Ischemia, loss of oxygen to the brain. How does that occur? Well, a stroke will do that, but so will POTS. That business I told you about with the dysautonomia, where people stand up and they can't maintain their blood pressure, and they collapse. And they collapse because they've lost the blood supply to their brain momentarily. Imagine you do that to yourself 20, 30 times a day, because you have POTS. Physical trauma, concussions, okay? Not lifted here, is hypoxia. Hypoxia, loss of oxygen to the brain. How can that happen? You stop breathing at night. It's a thing called sleep apnea. It impacts 5% of the population. 85% of that population is as yet undiagnosed. Sleep apnea will take 10 years off your life. So by beginning to understand this, it began to change the way we were thinking about making our diagnoses and the things we went looking for when we saw people with neuroinflammatory disease. And then, of course, there's infections. And what happens when microglia get activated and they start spewing out all of these different chemicals is this. Depression and anxiety, fatigue, malaise, sleep disturbances, endocrine dysfunctions, pain, gastrointestinal dysfunctions, fever, and POTS. These are symptoms of neuroinflammation. These are not primary diseases. They are symptoms of inflammation in the brain. We need to change the way we think. And that's why I wrote my first book. So this book talks about all of that process in the innate immune system and hopefully makes it accessible. All right, mast cells. That's what a mast cell looks like. Mast cells are in the periphery and in the brain. Um, and they get damaged the same way the microglia get damaged. And they start doing things they shouldn't ought to be doing in terms of firing off and getting all these chemicals released. And what happens? First, one of the easiest things to see is dermographia. What's dermographia? If I take my fingernail and just run it on your back or run it down your arm, you get a bright red line. You're not supposed to do that. But if you've got a lot of histamine in your system, you do do that. And then we found that mast cell activation syndrome, there's lots of things that when we quiet down and address the mast cells, get better. So we've got to be thinking in terms of what's going on with the immune system. This is the innate side of it. Now the adaptive. These are the smart guys. I give you a flu shot. 
What I am trying to do with the flu shot is train your adaptive immune system to recognize the flu bug. That way, if a flu bug comes into your system, we'll already have a whole set of antibodies of soldiers to go beat them up and make them go away before they can settle in. However, they're really, really specific, which is if we guess right in terms of the type of flu you have and that's coming around that year, we do great. We don't guess right as to what strain of flu it is, not so much. So the antibodies are very, very specific. And they have long-term memory. So an autoimmune condition is where the adaptive immune system gets confused. It starts attacking our own tissue. In rheumatoid arthritis, it's attacking joints. In lupus, it's attacking the brain, it's attacking connective tissue, it's attacking the muscle. Multiple sclerosis, it's attacking the brain. So you, this is a problem where classic autoimmunity, these diseases are classic autoimmunity, the body's attacking itself, bad thing. And then we proceed to try and shut down that process. And you've seen the commercials on for Embril and everything else for these autoimmune processes. Uh, and they say, oh, by the way, might cause cancer, <laughs> and you might get an overwhelming infection and die. And the reason those things might happen is because they shut down pieces of the immune system. Immune system we need. Now, again, you're balancing. You're not giving the drugs casually, and there is a place for these medications. But you have to understand what we're playing with. It's a big, complicated system. So in June of this year, uh, I, the foundation we created after the from some of the funding from the book uh, in conjunction with Georgetown University, uh, we hosted a program to look at autoimmune encephalopathy and infectious etiology. And we call it that mostly because I like saying that. <laughs> Sounds cool. What does it mean? It means a situation where the immune system is actually attacking the brain. So it's creating inflammation in the brain. And in particular, we're interested in infections that set that problem off. And guess what does that? Lyme. Bartonella. Babesia. So these infections can incite an immune reaction that sets off a mistaken identity situation where, where they were originally going after the Lyme, and now they're going after us. And what do we see in this? We see neuropsychiatric problems and chronic headaches, problems in uh, feeling and touch, we see seizures. We see this dysautonomia that's imbalanced in the sympathetic and chronic sympathetic system. We see chronic fatigue. We see fibromyalgia. We have been thinking about these diseases wrong. Okay? Neuropsychiatric is depression, anxiety disorder, schizophrenia, bipolar. We need to rethink what these diseases are and ask a bunch of different questions. And then, what are the infections that cause the problem? Well, strep, certainly we know from the pandas population, mycoplasma pneumonia, but Bartonella, toxoplasmosis, Babesia, Borrelia, Epstein-Barr, which is mono, and influenza. These are the known ones. There's more. So how do we go about testing for this autoimmune process? And the answer is, mm, we're working on it. <laughs> There's a lot of different receptors. And the receptor is kind of the ear that allows the, the nerve or cell to be able to hear what's going on. And so you have to know which receptor has been damaged. And so Cell Trends, a group of people out of Germany, have developed one set of antibody testings for this. Uh, testing for molecular labs was originally developed specifically for the cutting, the cutting ant panel looking at Pan's pandas population. <coughs> but we use these testing to help us understand if we can identify an autoimmune process going on in our patients. Now, there are other autoimmune panels. There's a Mayo Clinic autoimmune uh, panel. There's a, a number of other tests that we can do, OK? But if you're not asking the right question, you don't get the right answer. And these bugs, the infectious bugs, create a different set of antibodies than uh, rheumatoid arthritis does, Sjogren's does, than MS does. 
So we're trying to understand what set of testing to do for this. This is at least a start. And if it's positive, it's positive. We got autoimmunity. So when we go about treating this stuff, we want to be working on the innate immune system, which includes the mast cells and the microglia. Low-dose naltraxone. Anybody here know low-dose naltraxone? Been in the news lately. Been touted against this great pain reliever and replace of the opioids. Uh, it actually happens to work in some autoimmune disorders, such as Crohn's disease. It's a great adjunct. Little tiny dose. Naltraxone is a drug which we use for reverse narcotic overdose. Okay, at regular doses. That's 50 milligrams. We're using 0.25 to 4.25, 4.5. So little tiny dose has an impact on the microglia. And again, because we understand the physiology of what we're treating, we know what our targets are, so we know we can ask the questions. Is this a drug? Does this supplement work against us? And Celebrex and then a cycling. It's a cycling, right? Works against Lyme, but it also happens to quiet a microglial function. <coughs> Acupuncture can be effective. And by the way, so can exercise, so can meditation. All right, the mast cells in particular, there's some very specific things we need to go after. And the adaptive immune system is the most complex. And most commonly what we use is IVIG. Trying to get the insurance companies to approve that is almost impossible, uh, unless we have a couple of very specific conditions. Uh, plasmapheresis is a process where we actually wash the blood for all of all the uh, immunoglobins. Uh, rituximab, uh, there's a couple of, this is expensive and complex stuff. We're also looking at stem cells and we're looking at human tissue transplants from Morton's jelly because they possess massive amounts of anti-inflammatory factors and they cross the blood-brain barrier. So there's lots of anecdotal reports that this stuff works. So this is also yet another possibility. This is way off the books. This is not FDA approved. Uh, there's not a lot of studies and research on this. This is word of mouth among docs doing this stuff. And so what else are we missing? Okay? And we're an integrative health center. And so, yeah, we're looking for the cold co-infections. But we're also looking at toxins and mold toxicity because mold toxins there's early evidence that actually it'll suppress the immune system. Suppress the immune system, bugs not work, not having anything to fight it. So we have to go after that. Viral infections, such as Epstein-Barr, CMV and HPV. A EBV is mono. Once upon a time, my son is at college. He calls us up. He is sick as a dog. I sent him to the emergency room down at our school. I'm not thrilled with the emergency room response uh, and convinced them to do some testing they hadn't done to begin with. The test came back and I was really displeased by the numbers I was seeing and I turned to my lovely wife Fran and I said, sweetie, would you go get Matt? Which she did. So she drove down and brought Matt home. Matt was very, very sick. Matt was so sick I was sitting there going, does he have leukemia? And I took him to a friend of mine who was a leukemia specialist just to make sure. And he scratched his head for a weekend on it just to leave me sleepless. <laughs> and thank God Matt did not have leukemia. But I said, he's too goddamn sick. Good Lyme disease. And reemergence of the Epstein bar on top of the Lyme. Yeah. All right? Yeah. No biggie. We treated it. And four years later, he graduated from college, finishing the last two years of the school. These are the things you have to look for because these show up in people. We need to see. EDS, uh, Ellis Downlaw Syndrome, uh, we see a fair number of people who have you ever been to Cirque du Soleil and see the contortionist? That would be EDS, hypermobility type. <laughs> and a number of those people end up in a lot of pain. And if they happen to get Lyme on top of it, Lyme which loves to hang out in connective tissue, they're really sick. Sleep apnea and narcolepsy. We have to pay attention to those. If you are not sleeping, your brain is not detoxifying, and you get sicker. We need to get you sleeping. <coughs> and then we need to pay attention to hormones, because those can get seriously disrupted as a result of all this. Parasites that come into the system, your whole immune system is out of whack. And so you're susceptible to lots of things. 
So there's a lot of pieces. It's not something we simply go about treating casually. It ain't as simple as we'd like it to be. We have much more to learn. We've gained so much information in the last two years that we've made huge strides forward in being able to treat this. And we've gotten NIH to start giving a whole bunch more money in order to research this. Are we done? No. But we're getting better. And we're getting much closer. And we have a much better understanding of this whole business about the persisters. There's a whole significant percentage of people more that we're going to be able to help, that we're going to be able to, we believe, cure from Lyme finally. We want to go, but we are much closer than we've ever been. I thank you for your attention. This has been a lot of stuff to go through. So I tend to run through a lot of material in our heart. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> yes, please. I saw a, a therapy under the mast cell mm -hmm. treatment called keto Ketotypin. Ketotypin. Is that anything like putting the body in a ketosis? No. Oh, okay. No, but we do that sometimes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> now, ketotypin is a, uh, an interesting drug. It's mostly available as an eye drop here in the States. It's available as an antihistamine in uh, Europe and England. Uh, it's um, a combination mast cell stabilizer as well as an antihistamine. So it, it has a couple of properties to it that are really unique. And so we have that compounded, and we use that as one of the things. You have to layer what you're doing for math to, to get after mast cells. There's no one thing that fixes it. So you're going after it with H1 and H2 blockers, and ketotifin, and, and single layer, and a bunch of other things. So it's, it's a laid out process. That, that, and the follow on question though would be what, it, what, what is it that you prescribe ketosis for? So, um, so we'll use ketogenic diets because uh -huh. uh, they can be anti inflammatory in the system. But if you're really, really sick, you have no business going on a ketosis diet. It's too much for your system. Or maybe you modify ketosis. But frankly, what I do. As I turn around to Noor, <laughs> who's our nutritionist, I turn around to Noor, who's kind of well, my research assistant, and you give her applause for putting together all these slides. <laughs> uh, but also as our nutritionist. And we, you have to individualize things. There's no one size fits all. And if you're really, really sick, going into ketosis is a profoundly bad idea. That's right. And so how do we nourish your body? How do we heal you? How do we heal the gut? And then start to build you back up. But again, that's why it takes a team. I don't pretend to know anything. I go, you know, let me get the nutritionist in here. Let me have to talk to her. Yeah? Is biofilm and uh, sticky blood the same condition? Biofilm and sticky blood the same condition. I don't know what sticky blood is. Well, I wife is uh, genetically predisposed to it. Hypercoagulability. Right. No, they are two different things completely. So biofilms are generated by the um, bacteria to go hide in. It's a mucopolysaccharide coating and they line, the yeast does the same thing, the line uh, the coatings of the stomach and the, uh, the hypercoagulable uh, disorders, their genetic disorders, and uh, platelets either dysfunction or other parts of the clotting system dysfunction and leave you at higher risk for developing blood clots all over. So different things. Okay. Any other questions? Retroviruses. Um, can you address anything about retroviruses? Retroviruses. No. It's <laughs> 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 a great big topic. Um, yeah, HIV is a retrovirus. So they impair the immune system. Um, identifying them is tricky. Uh, testing for them is. You know, HIV, obviously, we're, we're very good at, but there's a lot of others that we're not so good at. Um, and then what to do about them once we find them. Also true. And you think um, ME-CFS is retroviral? I think ME-CSF is a neuroinflammatory disease of multiple etiologies. Certainly, uh, EBV is one of the factors involved. CMV is a factor involved. Mycoplasma pneumonia is a factor involved. Lyme is a factor involved. I think that MEC and mitochondrial dysfunction is also involved. That's a whole nother thing. But uh, so MECSF, um, I do not believe is a retrovirus. We argued that for 
uh, a year or two, and the end result of that was uh, we thought originally papers came out and said, ah, oh, wait a minute, we got it, and then the answer was, no, we didn't. So no, I don't believe MECSS is retroalized. Yeah. Uh, the NIH study you mentioned about disulfiram, can you give us more specifics? So it's not an NIH study, it's an NIH funded study. Uh, Yale, I believe, won one of the grants, and uh, so I'm not sure beyond Yale who else is, is going to get it. I imagine Hopkins will probably get one because they tend to do things like that. Uh, and Do you know the specifics of what I do not. doing? I do not, but you can find out. Oh. I mean, that's online. Go to NIH. NIH, look up disulfiram studies. Okay. And they'll give you the who's doing them, what, what awards have been done, or uh, what the proposals are for. And my second question is, it seems like those side effects you mentioned are pretty damn scary, and yet you're still recommending it. Can you comment on that? Listen, there are no drugs without side effects, okay? You, I'm not using them because I'm bored. I'm using them because I've got patients who are desperate and need help. Right. I'm using them because there's been enough experience with the drug. Now remember, I saw from 60 years of experience with this drug. And it's not like, well, 3% of the population develops brain damage and 4% of the population uh, develops blindness. We don't have that data. We just know in case reports that the risk is out there, but it's pretty damn low risk, actually. Devastating if it happens. But it's pretty low risk because we there aren't enough of it happening that it stopped anybody from prescribing it for alcoholics. Mm -hmm. And again, you know, you get 60 years of experience with it, with a lot of people, tens of thousands of prescriptions written. So we have some confidence that it's not as risky as it sounds, but we need full disclosure, and we need to keep our eyes open in terms of what we're doing and why we're doing it. So, you know, Dapzone, I just took somebody off Dapzone today because it crashed her, uh, her blood count, and stopped her blood from being able to carry oxygen the way it was supposed to, despite the other measures we were doing. This is the first patient that I've had that we couldn't continue on Dapsone because uh, the side effects were just too, too devastating. So Dapsone is off the list. But you find that out because you do regular blood tests, because you stay in communication with your patients, and you keep paying attention to what's going on. You don't give people these drugs and say, see you in a couple of months. We stay on top of this stuff, we are, and we're a partnership with our patients. Look, this is what the risks are, here's what's happening, think about this, we educate you, we want you to know, and then you also need to decide if this is okay for you or not. So, you know, it's a complex process. How many patients have you used disulfiram? Disulfiram, probably about a dozen at this point. Okay. Is there any correlation to how soon you get your initial antibiotics and how severe the chronic symptoms are? At the moment, it looks like the faster you get on top of this thing, the higher the probability you will not go into chronic phase. Yeah. So, not absolutely proven, but certainly that's what it looks like. So, if you catch the disease early, that other than um, that erythema migrans that my, my sister in law had, um, catch that. 80%, 85% of people who get Lyme disease get all better. What we've been talking about tonight is the 10 to 20% of people who don't. So the overwhelming majority of people get Lyme disease, get treated, get better, get done. Typically, how long are you treating somebody on Dapsone and then the same question on the antibuse? Like, how long do you think that treatment plan is? So uh, the newest stuff we're working with Originally, uh, Rich was suggesting doing 100 milli getting up to 100 milligrams of Dapsone and holding that for anywhere from six months to 18 months. The newer data uh, that he's worked with and is, uh, we were just talking about, uh, Dr. Lisa was mentioning when we were up there, is go to 200 milligrams. Not for everybody, okay? Your size, I'm probably not getting to 200 milligrams, okay? Your size, I'll head for 200 milligrams. So you've got to pay attention to who you're giving it to, but it looks like at 200 milligrams, along with probably several other medications, but at 200 milligrams, um, the, uh, the course of treatment is about three months. Wow. Yeah, exactly. That's a lot. Disulfiram, the course of treatment at 500 milligrams is about three months. So that's what we're looking at now. But again, we're really, really early on with the disulfiram stuff. So we have more to learn. Yeah. I wanted to ask you two questions. One is, 
you talked about it takes a village mm -hmm. in your office. I have a reason for asking. Number one, I wanted to see what your office, who is it, you know, what how many doctors, what type of doctors. I know you briefly mentioned. Secondly, I've got two relatives with Lyme, chronic Lyme, have had it for 14 years now, and they live in Atlanta, and they can, they are too sick to come up in this area. How do you treat patients who? are so ill they can't travel and how would you or do you treat I'm sure you do treat people out of town I just wonder how you manage something like that if you were to come. so uh, I I need to see people at the first visit mm -hmm. face to face and be able to examine them, put hands on them because that gives me a lot of information mm -hmm. a lot of understanding what I need to do but we have a lot of people we manage uh, over the phone so telemarket television okay. uh, telemedicine uh, so we have that process set up, and we'll, in between visits to the center, we'll, we'll manage them. Uh, and it depends. You know, I've got, I have people in 17, 18 different states at this point that, I, that I'm taking care of. And the reason I know that is because my not practice insurer said, you need to have a license in every state that you see somebody. I said, I live in Virginia. They practice, I practice in Virginia. So now I have all these lovely licenses. Yeah. Did I get, I'm sorry, I didn't get the no, second well, part of the I question. Was just, my niece, who yes. is now 17, is so ill that she cannot get in a car to travel across the city. So, you know, under extraordinary situation, you might be able to get her one time. But you're saying if you got one visit in person, there would be a way to manage things over the phone? Yeah. Or, okay. Yeah, but um, I just again, we need a diagnosis. In person. Okay, we need a diagnosis. Right. Okay? Diagnosis, 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 diagnosis. You need to know what you're treating. And then you get a higher chance of success. Sure. All right? She's severely horribly ill. This is, and, and again, a lot of people came to me originally with this chronic fatigue business and this chronic pain problems and complex regional pain syndrome. And then we found out they have Lyme disease. Mm -hmm. Or they have Bartonella. Or they have. I heard it's that easy to have Lyme confirmed them. And that's the other thing that's really fascinating. We see this happening in families. Well, they hike together on the same day. Well, why do they both develop chronicity of the disease and severity of the disease? So there's something genetically going on here also we don't know about yet. Well, their symptoms are mostly that, you know, and then they, it's interesting. Yeah. Some different sequelae that is just fascinating. Yeah, it's not a lot. And as far as practitioners, uh, Dr. Nayo uh, is internal medicine and uh, functional medicine. Dr. Lisa is family medicine, uh, Lyme literate, Lyme trained. Um, Dr. Dan uh, is physical medicine rehab. Dr. Dan does a, a lot of work with joint rehab in terms of uh, prolotherapy um, and, and joint repair. Um, and does a lot of work with hormones. Um, and who am I missing? Uh, and then we have an acupuncturist and we have a therapist. And not everybody has to come in and see all of us. We see one person. You know, we work with Jody, who's our therapist. You may work with Rebecca, who's the acupuncturist. Um, you may work with one of our physical therapists. Pat's standing there in the background. Uh, and our physical therapists have different specialties also. Craniosacral work versus pelvic floor work. Uh, Steve Moses, no. What? Dietitian. Oh, yes. Why? Well, I, I introduced them already. <laughs> so, so, yeah, sure. Yeah. Just a quick question. If you have any thoughts or experience about neurofeedback for the micro, microglial inflammation, that's... So neurofeedback is probably effective. I haven't seen the literature on it to tell me. Uh, certainly, we've seen evidence at least anecdotally of people who have done neurofeedback and seen benefits from it. Uh, so I think it's a useful tool. Uh, it's not one we make use of within our center. Um, so yeah, it probably has a role to play also. Yes? Yes? Yeah, um, I have chronic Lyme arthritis. I've had it for like nine years. And it used to be, it would, you know, it, it manifests itself in my knees, and I never knew when it was going to happen. I'd go in, they'd take the fluid out, put cortisone in. And then I went on Remicade right. infusions. Every eight weeks, gone. 
Um, do you recommend that, or should there be something else? I mean, can you comment on that, or so, should there be something else I should pursue? Because it has been successful for my treatment. So one thing that I would look at is whether or not there are persister cells. Because what is it, this whole thing of what turns on the immune system? Sometimes the immune system's gone rogue, and it's now attacking us, and it has no business doing that. we got to attack the immune system, remedy. Okay, shut down that piece of it. Other times, it's continuing to do what it should be doing because there's a bug in the system, and the body's picking up on it and continuing trying to kill it. And so if it's a persister system situation, we need to kill the bug because otherwise the body should just do what it's doing. And that immune response is quite appropriate. It's not so much the autoimmune response as it is. It's the autoimmune system but it's not an autoimmune disease in that regard. So you're shutting down a piece of the immune system, but maybe it should be functioning. Maybe it's doing what it's supposed to be doing because there are persister cells in the system and that's what we need to kill. And that's part of the trick is, is you know, when we go after the immune system, is it really just doing what it's supposed to be doing? In which case we've missed persister cells or other bugs? Or has it gone rogue? has it become totally dysfunctional, and now it's doing lots of damage. Uh, and it's about teasing that out that becomes a bit tricky. Yeah. Has IVIG been proven to cure long-term HIV infection? No, absolutely not. Has anything proven to mm -hmm. cure Lyme? No. Mm -hmm. No. IVIG does not cure Lyme. The purpose of IVIG is to shut down, to quiet down. So we're giving you something that you're making too much of. All right? Let me preface this. I'm not entirely sure why IVIG works. We think this is how it works. So you're making too much of something. And so what we, huh? I'm sorry, intravenous immunoglobin. So immunoglobins are the things that make antibodies. Um, good question. I'm not speaking English. <laughs> so, um, so what we're doing with the intravenous immunoglobins is we're replacing, we're giving you something and telling your body, it's okay, you don't need to do this right now. You can rest. And we're hoping that over time, as we continue to do it, because IVIG is not a treatment, it's a whole series of treatments that we have to give for many months, year, year and a half, two years. We're hoping that your immune system will quiet down and stop doing that and then stop making too much of the immunoglobins. And then it'll stop. Plasmapheresis is, eh, screw it, we're going to wash it all out, which is a great big deal. You're in the hospital, you're attached to machines for two weeks at a time. Um, and we're taking all of the immunoglobins out in the hopes that it's a reset. We're really kind of primitive at this stuff. Yeah. You had a slide that showed like four phases of treatment of the bacteria that ended in the biofilms and with antibiotics treatment in each of those phases. Mm -hmm. How long is that cycle of treatment and how often do you pulse around with it? So the first three uh, pieces of that, basically going after the intracellular and extracellular <coughs> components of it. Um, the rule of thumb with chronic Lyme, the rule of thumb with chronic Lyme is uh, we treat until there are no symptoms, plus two or three months. So we're always doing this. And then we're rotating this in. So when I first start treating people, this is where I'm going. All right, now am I using all these antibiotics? Sometimes. Sometimes I'm just using one from column A, one from column B, one from column C. But now, we're really thinking about we need to be doing this also. So now we're, we are doing this and with the understanding of where we're going after and what we're going after. But we'll layer again and see what you need. All right, if you come in, yeah, I've been previously diagnosed with Lyme, and I give you Doxy, I give you a month of Doxy, do you want to get all better? Cool, we will leave you alone. But if you're not, then I'm going to start layering, and then we'll start going after other things. And how long typically is that cycle? Or Until you stop having symptoms, person. plus two or three months. <laughs> so you, that's the rule of thumb. That's what you're trying to do in terms of killing you. Yeah. 
go back here. So, oh. God. so when you get, get when you get the rash, yep. you go to the doctor. Yep. They say two weeks of doxy. Yep. What's your I think it's profoundly under treatment. <laughs> okay, I would treat for at least a month. I treat for a minimum a month, and I want to see all resolution of all symptoms. Okay, and I tend to be fairly aggressive. I will treat with doxy. I will treat with one of the intracellulars, and I'll rotate in something for the system. So I'm going to treat for at least a month. Have you ever heard of a lab called Vibrant Wellness? Vibrant Wellness. I've heard of it, but I've never used it. I don't, so I don't know any really details. About it. One more question? So, one more question. Two more questions. Okay. <laughs> so I was going to back up from what she says. I, I go hiking a lot and find those people and say somebody picks up a really trusted thing to find out the stuff you care about it. It's just lying. Right. Really. Yeah. What would you do if obviously you're waiting for a bullseye rash to show up? You want to be preventative. Right. But what would you do with that? In that case, I'd probably do two weeks of doxy. Two weeks of doxy. Two weeks of doxy. And they palm the area. <laughs> I just, I have no patience for these things. <laughs> but yeah, I would do two weeks of doxy and, um, and, and, and see see whether or not you, if it hurts. That's another thing also. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So and one more question. Hang on. Um, can you tell me is there a difference between being histamine intolerant and having mast cell activation syndrome, and are there different ways to deal with that? Histamine intolerance uh -huh. is probably a mast cell activation syndrome. Okay. 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 So that's so. so they're probably, probably so it's the same thing. There are other things that can go wrong with mast cells, uh -huh. but they tend to be fairly nasty and rare. So they're cancers and whatnot. Uh, but uh, this histamine intolerant is probably a mast cell activation syndrome. Okay. Okay. So All right. I've been told I'm not allowed to answer any more questions. Thank you very very much. For